Hi, thanks for all the great comments from the previous video and some really good suggestions there. So really nice discussion and also highlighted an issue that I've missed. So a big thank you to Richard Rudek who pointed out that this gate driver, um, I completely missed this internal schematic diagram, but this is an emitter follower. And what that means is there is no level shifting going on. So when we were trying to drive this with the output of the microcontroller, the maximum output that we'd ever get from the source here is actually 0 0.6 volts less than the output from the microcontroller. So in that case, we'd be getting just slightly less than three volts into the MOSFET. So the gate would never be switched on fully and we would have had lots of losses and the MOSFET probably would have heated up and quickly died. So that's one of the things we're going to address today and it does highlight something which I always recommend whenever you design a schematic or a PCB just take a day or two to reflect on it before you order it. If you try and place the order in a hurry then almost certainly a couple of days later you'll realize your error and then either have to go back and try and cancel the order or you'll have to make some modifications or, or order another board. Now unfortunately I did rush into ordering the PCB but uh, our sponsor for this video, PCBWay, which is where I've ordered the PCBs from, were great in that although they'd already put it on the panel, it wasn't in production yet. And I was able to email the sales rep because when you create an account at PCBWay, you get assigned a specific sales rep and you can contact them for information about your order and to make amends and that kind of thing. So fortunately, she was able to take the PCB off the panel that was about to go in production and allowed me to email some updated Gerber files. So that's what I was able to do fortunately, so I haven't wasted those boards. So let's have a look at the issue that we've got uh, with this gate driver. So this is the internal diagram of the gate driver and what we want to do is drive the gate of that MOSFET with at least 10 volts to make sure it's fully turned on, which is what we talked about in the previous video. But the internal diagram shows that these are two bipolar devices in an emitter follower configuration. And the emitter follower basically means the voltage on the emitter here follows the base, but we have this 0 0.6 volt drop. We always have 0 0.6 volts approximately between the base and emitter. And therefore, if we feed in 3.3 volts here, we have a 0 0.6 volts drop on here, and we actually only end up with 2.7 volts here when we want to turn this transistor fully on. So that's absolutely no good. What we need to do is drive the voltage here with at least 10.6 volts in this application because we want this to be here at 10 volts. So we need to be able to drive this a little bit higher than that. Now we're feeding the gate driver from a 12 volt supply that was available on the little PCB. So that's absolutely fine. We've just got to come up with some kind of arrangement to turn our 0, 0 to 3.3 volt um, switching waveform from our microcontroller to a 0 to 12 volts or approximately 12 volt signal to be able to drive our MOSFET. So things have started to get a little bit more complicated. I was hoping for a single chip solution for the gate driver and they are available but the cost escalates. So let's have a look at some of the options that we've got available. So the first option is just to use an integrated gate driver that already has the level shifting built in and we did look at one uh, the other day, I think we looked at the MCP1415 and I turned that down based on cost. Now it has dropped in price very slightly just in those couple of days. And also a new product has now come into stock. So this wasn't available, this has come in this morning. 1,500 of these microchip ones at 61 pence, which is a really attractive price. Unfortunately, I've already designed the new PCB and sent it out. So now I can't use this one. Uh, but this one would have been ideal, although it has a slightly lower drive capability. I think it would have been fine for this application. And here is the internal diagram, which is basically where the magic is happening. So uh, we've got a couple of inverters here. This is just to provide enough drive for the two FETs that are built into this device. But the level shifting is actually done by this Schmidt buffer here. So there's a VREF, which is basically setting the thresholds we can feed our input from 0 to 3.3 volts based on the spec in this data sheet. And this one device will do the level shifting. And all of these um, logic devices in this IC are actually connected to VDD, which is our input supply voltage. In this case, this would be 12 volts. So this would work perfectly. And what we can take from this is that if we could find a buffer like this, 
that can be supplied from a wide voltage range, you know, up to 12 volts, maybe 16 volts, but the input threshold is suitable for 0 to 3.3 volt levels, and this would be ideal. So that would be the next search. Now our DigiKey search is not necessarily the best place to go for specific logic devices. It works fine for transistors and that kind of thing. But when you're looking for specific functions in logic, you're better off going to one of the manufacturer websites. So we're at the TI website here. I've already pre-selected devices, uh, non-inverting buffers and drivers with a supply voltage maximum of greater than 12 volts. And the op only option here is 18 volts. So we've got six devices left. The first three are military grade versions of the bottom three. So here we've got a CD4050. It's a six channel buffer with a supply voltage range from three to 18 volts, which sounds good. Let's have a look at the data sheet. And we first of all have a quick look at the schematic diagram. Now what we can see here is this doesn't look like it's gonna do any level shifting. We can see we've basically got the same configuration that we had in the gate driver. So if we start looking at the specifications, we're looking for the input voltage parameters. So um, V input high for the CD4050, if we supply the chip with 15 volts, we will get 13.5 volts out, and our minimum input voltage here is 11 volts. So this device is not gonna be any good for us. So we'll quickly check the other devices in that list so here we have the CD4054, which is a liquid crystal display driver, but we could be able to adapt it for this application. And this one does actually have level shifting. So you can kind of see in the diagram here uh, what it looks like. So we've got some latches, then the level shifters, and then the display drivers. So although this isn't specifically ideal for our application, it looks like this could do some level shifting. But again, we need to look at those parameters in the data sheet. And we've got our V input high voltage minimum. When we supply it with um, 5 volts here, it's saying that we need at least 3.5 volts. So once again, this is not going to work for us. So uh, I think we need to look at another section on the TI website. So next, looking at voltage translators and level shifters, we'll view all products and then we'll do some uh, filtering on the side here. So our V out max we want to be at least 12 volts. And we've got 11 parts left here. And then we've got our high input voltage min, and this probably needs to be about two volts for the microcontroller. So have we got any options here? It looks like we've got the CD4504. So this is a six bit level shifter, and we'll look at the data sheet. And again, we can see here, we've got two separate voltage domains. So we've got VCC, and then we've got VDD, and what we need to do is make sure that VCC is suitable for our 3.3 volt rail, and that we can do that level shifting. So we'll have a look further down in the data sheet. Now looking through the data sheet, they haven't actually specified the range for VCC, which is quite confusing. Um, but what we can see here is if we were to supply VCC with five volts, and we wanted the output to be 13.5 volts just along here, our minimum voltage to turn the output on is 3.5 volts. So once again, this device is not gonna do the job for us. Now a good place to search for some suggestions is in the art of electronics. And we're looking at this section here, power switching from logic levels. And the first drawing here is a relay driver. Now this actually is basically what we've already got on the design. The difference here is that we're only dealing with a very small current through this relay. So the fact that it has quite a high on resistance at this low voltage here doesn't really have any detrimental effect. Because we're drawing much more current through the transistor, we care about this, and so we want this on resistance to be much lower. Uh, then they've got some options here with uh, a P-type MOSFET. Uh, same here as well. So they're using uh, a P-type MOSFET, which we don't want to use. They generally do have a higher on resistance anyway. When we're talking about driving an N-channel MOSFET, some of the suggestions here are things like charge pumps and drivers. Um, we've got a dedicated microchip device, the TC4420. This one comes in at about two pound at DigiKey. So there's no obvious suggestions here for how to do our level shifting. So then we come back to our very common form of level shifting, and that is with an open collector transistor. So what's happening here is we've got a resistor that is pulling down the base under normal conditions or if it's open circuit. 
and that turns this transistor off and basically the output here is pulled up to V plus through some form of impedance. Now this is where this type of driver does have some disadvantages and why you may not want to use this directly to drive a MOSFET is because although it can turn off that MOSFET very quickly through this transistor, when the transistor is turned off, we have to drive the gate through some form of impedance because if we didn't have this here, the moment this transistor turned on, we'd just get a dead short through here and cause some problems. Now, if we turn on the input, so supply this with a voltage greater than 0 0.6 volts. Remember, we've got our voltage across here, 0 0.6 volts. This transistor turns on and it pulls this node low and that will turn our output off. Now, what you've probably just noticed there is we have now created an inverter. So if we have an input high here, we've turned on our transistor and then we've pulled the output low. So we've created an inverter, which technically is fine. Now we could drive this quite happily from our PWM output on our microcontroller. And in fact, almost every microcontroller out there has the ability to invert the PWM if you're doing it with hardware, or if you're bit banging the PWM waveform, then obviously you can do that yourself. The problem that I have with this is that it's very easy at startup for problems to occur because the natural um, situation will be for this transistor to be turned on, which means that you end up turning the LEDs on. And when we've got um, you know 200 watts of LEDs, if we have any kind of brief interruption in the power supply, those lights are gonna flash. We want it to always naturally be turned off. And obviously the simple way to do that is then to just use a standard logic buffer, uh, inverter, sorry, on the input. And that is exactly what I've implemented on our design. So here is our updated schematic. Unfortunately, things have started to end up a little bit more complicated than I anticipated. Now, one change that I've implemented compared to this diagram is I've put a pull down resistor here to keep this transistor turned off. Now, when we've got a logic gate here, that pull down is going to do absolutely nothing because the drive strength of this buffer or inverter is far stronger than a weak pull down. So really we want the pull down to be on the input side to this buffer. So that's what we've got on the schematic here. So we can see we've got some pull downs on PWM 1, 2 and 3. These are the inputs to these inverters. We've got a 1K base resistor into our SOT23 BC817 NPN transistor a pull-up of 10k and then that is feeding those gate drivers. So unfortunately, as you can see, this is slightly more complicated um, and in reality it's ended up being very slightly more expensive than one of those dedicated gate drivers that had everything built in. But uh, I'd already placed the order for these parts. This is the problem with rushing through a design. Um, you end up ordering parts and then you realise something isn't quite adequate. Uh, we've made this slightly more complicated. Assembly is going to take a little bit longer because we've got a few more components. In the end, it probably would have been better just to order the slightly more expensive gate drivers and swallow the cost um, rather than increase the cost here with assembly and the extra component. And you can see here the inverter is 34 pence at DigiKey. Then we've got the uh, NPN transistor. Now I actually got these ages ago from LCSC. I bought these in bulk. So we're talking about one cent, which is, we can forget about that pretty much in terms of cost. So now we're basically at the same price as one of the integrated microchip gate drivers. So really our cost here is gonna be just an extra assembly time. But that is our updated design. And we can have a look at the updated PCB that I've sent off to PCBWay. There was no additional cost for this because it was the same outline, basically the same number of wires. Uh, we just changed the footprint slightly, so that was nice. We didn't have to pay any more for the PCB. And here is the updated design. So you can see here are the inverters, U5, U4, and U6. We've got the uh, NPN transistors. And then also something that we've added in, which I actually added in um, just before I uploaded the video, is some gate resistors on the MOSFETs. And we'll just quickly talk about that now. So Texas Instruments have got this really useful tech note about external gate resistor design for gate drivers. And if you watched my video a couple of years ago about ceramic capacitors, it's a very similar issue. Basically, we've got a very low impedance source, our gate driver driving a capacitor, but we've got all kinds of parasitics in between. And that can cause oscillations and ringing, but it can also cause 
high currents to be drawn by the gate driver if it happens to be switching at part of the waveform where it is ringing in the most undesirable po point. So I highly recommend having a look at this data sheet. But the thing to remember is adding the footprint in the PCB is almost free. And it means that even if you don't need it, you can link it out. But if you start having problems with EMC or some other issues, you've got that option there to add in the pads. And on your prototype board, always add it in. If it turns out if it's not an issue, then in your final production board, if you need to save that bit of space, you can just link out the resistor and just not have it on the design. So PCB way, I've already got the PCB in manufacture. You can see here that we are now at the drilling stage. And the nice thing is you can track your PCB as it goes through the production steps on the PCB Way website. And they also have some details here if you're interested in what each of these steps are. For example, if we want to look at what drilling means, you can click on view details. And then they've got a section here with a video that shows what is happening at that particular point in the assembly process. And that can be really useful to understand all of these steps because in your career, some of these um, steps are gonna be quite important and influence some of your design decisions. So well worth taking a look at the PCB Way website and all the various steps that it takes to manufacture your PCB. So unfortunately, the version of Proteus that I'm using is not quite up to scratch in terms of 3D renders, but the PCB should look something like this once it's done. So as soon as the boards arrive, we'll assemble them up and give them a test and make sure everything's working properly. And we might probe some of the points on the PCB, particularly the gate and that kind of thing, to see what's going on in detail. So thanks for the comments that were left on the previous video. It's really nice to have that technical discussion. I think a lot of people that don't have the technical depth find some of these comments really useful. So if you've got any further thoughts, don't forget to leave those in the comments section down below. Big thank you to PCB Way for sponsoring this video. And until next time, thanks for watching.